Sure. The next talk is algebraic program analysis. I'll be given by John Cipher. Yep. So, everybody, my name is John, and uh, so I'm here to talk to you about sort of a series of research that's been going on, sort of a collaboration between Wisconsin and Princeton with sort of all these very nice people. Um, so, this is sort of this uh, analysis framework that I'm going to sort of talk to you about, and uh, we've had some sort of recent success with this at some of these top tier conferences. Um, so, for this talk, I'm going to uh, sort of highlight a few of this work here. I'm going to start off with sort of the basic, where this story sort of all started with this compositional recurrence analysis. Um, we're going to talk about some of this work we presented at POPL 18 about including some nonlinear information. I'm going to talk about some of this work we presented at POPL this year, um, sort of about improving certain precision. So sort of the overall tool for this line of research I'm going to refer to is this sort of CRA or ICRA. I'm going to sort of use those interchangeably. Okay. So what is algebraic program analysis? So it's sort of this alternative viewpoint to sort of the traditional abstract interpretation sort of framework. Um, that's sort of not always better, not always worse, but it's just sort of a slightly different perspective, and that's what I want to sort of talk about today. So before we get into that, let's talk about sort of what the traditional version is. So traditionally, if I want to capture some sort of abstract behavior of some particular program, I define some abstract domain, which is this gives me this lattice, and I have this sort of approximation order which I use to sort of to test whether or not I've reached some fixed point. And it gives me this sort of uh, naive iteration sort of algorithm where I, I start with my initial states. I apply these abstract transformers that get me sort of bigger and bigger abstractions. And I keep going and I keep going, combining that with sort of previous information that I have until I reach this fixed point. And then the whole theory says that that fixed point uh, says that, you know, that would be a safe and sound approximation of the real concrete states of the original program. Now, one of the things that I sort of want to highlight that's common to a lot of really uh, common to a lot of interesting abstract domains is that they don't satisfy what's called this ascending chain condition. Now, essentially, all that means for this particular case is that this naive iteration algorithm may always not terminate. You can always just keep climbing forever and never reach a fixed point. So because of that, a lot of abstract domains are comes with these additional widening operators, which simply means that you usually take sort of bigger coarser jumps in your, uh, in your abstraction, which guarantee that you're going to reach a fixed point. Now, essentially, that means that you're sacrificing some level of precision at the benefit of guaranteeing termination. But we sort of don't like that sort of framework in some sense because uh, it's sort of brittle. It's unpredictable. We think of these widening operators as sort of heuristic. Um, so anyway, so the alternative that I'm going to talk about today is what was called this algebraic analysis. So what we're going to do is we're going to create these abstract summaries. We're not going to summarize abstract states necessarily. And what I mean by summary is we're going to say how the program state is affected between two different program points. Rather than saying these variables at this particular program point take on this particular value, we're going to say how the state changes between these two points. And so what we'll do is we're going to build up more and more complex path summaries using these uh, sort of operations that come with your, your domain. So we have this abstract combine, which we're going to use this essentially if you have a branch in your, uh, in your program and you have two paths coming together, this is what you use to combine those two different information. Uh, you have this abstract extend for like sequencing operator to build and build more complex paths. Um, so the presence of these operators is not too strange. If you can formulate your analysis problem as a semi-ring, that's not too, uh, too bizarre. What is strange is this presence of this explicit star operator and this explicit op, uh, iteration operator. And that's really what's going to set this algebraic analysis apart from the traditional sort of framework. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. That's sort of where the real interesting part of this work goes. But anyway, so what this means is for your overall algorithm is that you still give these interpretations for instructions to say essentially how individual instructions affect uh, my state. And then you to compute an over approximating summary, instead of using this iterative algorithm, you're just going to evaluate uh, using these operators over here, and then that's just going to give you your overall summary. So let's look at an example. So here's a very basic example. It's a while loop. Starts at uh, x starts at 0, counts up to n, exits the loop. Very basic. For the simplicity of this presentation, let's also just assume that n is greater than or equal to 0. It doesn't matter if it is or not, but just for simplicity of presentation. Okay. So first thing we do is we're going to get the control flow graph of this particular program, which is given here. You get these control locations, which are these blue nodes, and you get these edges, which are labeled with instructions from your program. So 
And the goal for the algebraic analysis is we want to summarize the effect of taking any path that takes me from the start state to this exit state. And we want to summarize all the set of paths that go from here to here. So we do this in a two-step process. So the first step is what we want to do is compute a regular expression that tells me the set of paths that take me from start to exit. So we use a path expression algorithm for that. So just for the simplicity of presentation, I'm going to relabel the uh, edges in this particular program using A, B, C, and D. And then what you do is you can sort of run these path expression algorithms, which collapse the control flow graph down, and you eventually get this final regular expression that describes a set of paths from start to exit. OK. And then what you want to do is you want to reinterpret that regular expression using the operators that you have in your semantic algebra. So for example, this is the operators in uh, sort of the normal regular expression operators. You have a dot, you have a choice not shown here, and you have this uh, star operator. And essentially what you're doing is you're taking your individual interpretation for each one of these instructions and then evaluating using your uh, operators that you define for your semantic algebra. So I'm going to talk about a particular uh, example of an algebraic analysis, and we'll analyze that last program I just showed you. All right, so this thing that we're going to consider is this domain called CRA. Um, so CRA, we're going to build summaries, which are built out of these two vocabulary transition formulas, which are going to be these formulas over the program variables x. And we're going to think that they, each uh, program variable in the program has two copies. It has a prime version and it has an unprime version. And the prime version is going to denote the post state of a sequence of a path, and the, uh, the unprime version is going to be the pre state. So we're going to describe the effect of taking some paths of turbulence of the post state in terms of the pre state. OK, so the, uh, this combine operator is very simple. It's just logical disjunction. Uh, the sequencing operator is where I sort of introduce this x double prime variable. I take phi to x double prime, and then I take psi from x double prime to x prime. Zero is false. One is the identity. Um, but then the, the star is sort of where the really interesting things happen. So that's where the main, main sort of focus is here. But for this particular example, uh, the star isn't too bad, so we're just going to go ahead for it. So here was our original example. Here was this path expression that describes a set of paths of this program, and here are the corresponding different definitions for the, these uh, alphabet symbols. So here are the corresponding interpretations for these particular instructions in the CRA domain. Uh, for example, this CRA interpreting the instruction A, just setting x to be 0. So the essential effect of that is that x prime, after taking that state, is going to be 0. OK. So, um, oh, and also each one of these uh, instructions also has this additional conjunct that n prime stays at n. I'm not including that just for presentation purposes. OK. So then the way we're going to finally evaluate this overall program is we're going to take these uh, path expression sort of piece by piece and evaluate them. So here is the loop body, which is the effect of taking B and then C, which I just give my interpretation of B and my interpretation of C. This is just using this definition here on the left. And then the basic simplifying uh, steps says that this is the effect of our loop body. We say X must be less than N, and then X gets increased by 1. So then to summarize the loop, we need to compute this formula under this, uh, this iteration operator. So at a high level, we're just thinking about what's the effect of taking this formula many times. So for this particular program, it's not too complicated. Essentially, since this loop iterates x by 1, if I'm going to, let's say, this loop iterates k times, the effect of uh, the value of x on that kth iteration is just going to be whatever it initially started of plus k because I'm adding 1 each time. And that's pretty much it. So here's the. Uh, uh, the summary, you say you introduce this existentially quantified k, which represents the number of times this loop iterates. x is less than n, and x gets increased by k. So then what I do to finally analyze the whole program is I tack on my uh, initial value for x as well as my loop terminating condition. I just interpret in terms of um, my domain, simplifying. It's not too important here. Essentially, the loop terminating condition ensures that this loop exits exact, or iterates exactly k, or n times. So k equals n, and then I learn that the final value of x just is n, and n stays the same. So this is the overall summary for this particular program, and that's basically how uh, sort of CRA works as the overall structure. So let's, uh, let's dive in a little bit more and try and understand the magic that goes in about how to summarize sort of arbitrary loops. So we want to consider some sort of arbitrary formula, and we want to be able to compute sort of the effect of taking this formula many, many times, some arbitrary number of times. 
So the way we do it and the way our system works is you feed in this, essentially, this loop body formula to this recurrence extractor. What this recurrence extractor is going to give you is a sequence of C finite recurrences. Essentially, a C finite recurrence, just really briefly, is going to be uh, sort of formulated as a sort of a matrix where you have these uh, vector of variables here, and you just consider uh, the next step uh, of this recurrence in terms of a linear transformation of where they are now plus some additive vector b here. Okay, and then the solution space of a C finite recurrence includes these sort of polynomial and exponential terms. And I just want to highlight that here because that allows our system to generate these nonlinear terms automatically and put them in our overall formula. Okay, so essentially we give C finite recurrences off to a C finite recurrence solver. Uh, that solver gives some closed form solution. And then what you do is you project that closed form solution back into a transition formula by introducing this existentially verified k, representing the number of times that you may take this particular uh, uh, you know, loop, essentially. You have this uh, loop guard, which is just the pre-state of the, the, the loop. And then you tack on this recurrent solution here. OK, so let's look at a particular example. So here's a particular example. It's a, it's a basic while loop. And you have four variables in here. So there's a temp variable in here. That's not really important. It's just, uh, uh, just there so I don't have to define parallel assignment. But if we're looking at the variables x, y, and i, we can see that there's this very simple update to x, y, and i that I can essentially just read off this loop here, right? For the example, on any iteration of this loop, x gets increased by 2 times whatever the previous value of it was. I add y, and then I also add i. Okay, so this recurrence here expresses this dynamics of the loop in terms of this, uh, the number of times this loop iterates k. So you pass this uh, recurrence here off to your recurrence solver. It gives you a closed form solution. And uh, note that there's, if you can see it, there's uh, exponential terms, there's polynomial terms, there's linear terms. Uh, this uh, solution here is assuming that x, y, and i are initially zero. It doesn't have to assume that, but just for simplicity of presentation. And then what you do is you tack in, uh, on your loop, your initial conditions for this loop and your loop terminating condition, and you discover that this loop has to iterate exactly k times, k equals i, and essentially you can get this overall summary for this loop here just by plugging in k equals 10 into this summary here and evaluating. So this is the actual summary that we would compute for this loop directly, and there's no iteration involved. Okay, so. Uh, we talked about recurrent solutions for a little bit. Let's talk about recurrence extraction. This is sort of where a lot of the work gets done. Because from the previous examples, you may think I'm sort of uh, uh, cheating a little bit. Because you could essentially read off the recurrences just directly from the loops. So we're just directly increasing x by 1. And then this previous one, it was a very contrived example that I chose that uh, you know, had this nice linear relationship. But real loops have branches in them. They have nestings. They have sub nonlinear behavior. Very complicated things can happen in real loops. And we want to be able to handle all these situations with some sort of general method. And so this recurrence extraction module essentially takes an arbitrary formula and is going to extract you know, potentially equational information when it can. And then other times, it might have to get these over approximating recurrences that we're still going to hand off to a recurrence solver. And it's going to solve, and we're going to get some over approximating information. So I'm going to give a couple examples here. So this first situation is what we call these like term recurrences. So here's a particular program. If you can see it, there's a, there's a branch in this loop. And essentially on, uh, on one end of the branch, x gets, it uh, x gets updated to some value, y stays the same. On the other branch, y gets updated and x stays the same and i gets updated each time. So that's essentially what this formula can, encodes here. And the difference, thing, difference in this situation, what we had previously, is this formula contains a disjunction. So it's a little unclear how we're supposed to handle that. So uh, I can just tell you neither the variable x in this example nor the variable y actually satisfy a C finite recurrence. However, if we consider this sort of like almost like a ghost term, x plus y, uh, that actually does satisfy a C finite recurrence. So if we consider the value of x plus y on any path through this loop, it actually has this particular relationship. So, you know, more formally, this loop body here implies this formula here. Okay. 
And so what you can think of is that you can introduce these new variables to represent these ghost terms that we're going to uh, uh, you know, solve a C finite recurrence of. So for example, let's just let V uh, be X plus Y. And then I can extract this uh, recurrence not over X nor Y, but over the term X plus Y. And this allows me to capture some dynamics of the loop here. So I give that to my recurrence solver. It gives me back this recurrence solution. And then I cast that back by putting my, my previous definition for V, which is X plus Y. And so this will be the overall summary that we get for this loop. But note here that this loop here does, or this summary doesn't actually characterize what happens to X nor Y. I don't know what happens to X or Y, but I do know what happens to the sum X plus Y. Okay, so another situation that could happen, and I'm just going to give this brief example of, is what we call these recurrence inequations. So sometimes uh, you can't find a recurrence for program variables, and you can't find a recurrence over terms of program variables. So it's, and, you know, in this particular case, I have this variable X. Sometimes it gets updated, sometimes it doesn't. I don't know what happens to it. But what I do know is that there is something I can extract from this, and then namely, X uh, is no bigger or is no smaller than what it started out previously, and x increases no more than one. So these two pieces of information, I can extract to two different recurrences with now an, inequ an inequality in there rather than an equation. So I can solve these two equations and I get this final loop summary that says I don't know exactly what happens to x, but I do know that it, it's no bigger than, or it's no smaller than what it started off with and it's no bigger than x, uh, x plus k, the number of times this loop iterates. Okay, so here was returning back to our, our original picture. So just to fill in the details a little bit, um, so the basic idea is this is the, the ultimate form of a C finite recurrence here. We also have this B matrix, which defines which terms you're gonna extract a, uh, a recurrence equation over, or, yeah. And then uh, you, know, you solve the solution and you put the solution back into your overall formula, which is a function of the terms that you're looking at recurrences over and k, the number of times this loops iterates. So just to give a brief, uh, brief uh, uh, statement about what this recurrence extractor does to let you know it is like a sort of a general solution. The basic idea is you take this formula, you abstract to some bounding polyhedron, and then you do polyhedral manipulations to eventually get something in this form, which is a, just a direct recurrence that you can solve. I'm more than happy to talk about more of the details of that algorithm. Some more. Okay, so now I want to talk briefly about this sort of other work that we presented at, at Popple this past year. Um, so consider this program here. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's an if inside this, this branch, and basically what happens is this, uh, this loop iterates and x increases up until x gets to the value 50, and then by that time, uh, this then branch starts getting executed, and then x and y start executing in lockstep. Okay. So this is a simplified uh, sort of uh, path expression for this loop. So I'm going to have A correspond to the case where I don't take the then branch, right? X just gets in updated. It has this particular uh, formula. Note Y doesn't get increased here. And then I'm going to have this B represent the case where you do take the then branch. And so it does have this case where Y gets updated. Now, if we were going to use sort of the previous framework that I've been describing previously, uh, we would take and we'd come up with some formula for this loop body here called phi body, which is just the disjunction of taking the path A and taking the path B, which is right here. Now, the port, you know, you take my word for it, is that you can at not get an exact information for what happens to Y, because on some branch it goes up by one, and another branch, nothing, it just stays the same. So what that means is for our overall summary is that we're going to get imprecision introduced for when we analyze y. And we're going to get this final summary here that x is somewhere either between 50 and 150, which is not strong enough to prove this assertion here. That's just an observation. So the previous example showed that the analysis of this path expression here was not good enough to prove the assertion. However, there's a note and there's an idea here. This uh, this path expression came directly from the syntax of the program. There's a branch in the program, there's a branch in my path expression. However, the semantics of this program says that not all the paths described by this path expression are actually possible. The path expression taking B, which corresponds to taking the then branch, which means X is bigger than 50, you have to keep taking the then branch then, because X is staying bigger than 50. 
So you can imagine there's this prune path expression here, which essentially removes those infeasible paths. And then you say, what happens if I analyze this new path expression? Well, I'm going to short answer as a, I'm going to actually get the exact answer and exactly characterize what happens to y. So here's the basic overall new idea. This is the sort of traditional steps of the algebraic analysis. So I get my program, I get my path expression, I evaluate, and we're going to add in this new step in here where I refine the path expression by removing infeasible paths. It reduces the, uh, this path expression in terms of languages, but they still represent the same set of concrete actions because I'm only removing infeasible paths. Okay, so what you can consider though, and this is the thing that we considered for the paper, is what if you analyze your original path expression and compare that precision with when you analyze this refined path expression. Now intuitively, this refined path expression should give you a better answer because I'm more closely resembling the actual concrete paths of my original program. But we asked the question, can this actually get a worse answer if you give a ref uh, analyze this refined path expression? And the answer is yes. X, uh, the, this refined interpretation can actually be worse. So this is sort of our contribution, is that we gave an axiomatization for sort of a class of these algebraic analysis that allows you to weakly characterize analysis precision and give an algorithm that essentially performs control flow refinement, but it includes this additional condition here where you respect this new order that we introduce, and that gives you this additional precision guarantees that you're not going to actually re uh, create any worse answers. Uh, so I just want to give some quick experimental highlights uh, from that paper as sort of overall. So something that we all and analyze our tool against is these little micro benchmarks usually from like the SV comp sort of uh, competition which are contain these little true assertions and the goal is to prove as many assertions as possible. And so we implemented refinement, the sort of technique that I just described on top of this POPL18 work, which is what I've been describing previously, as well as another algebraic analysis that we implemented based on the uh, ideas of Anacorda and, and others. And so the overall experimental highlights of this particular work is that with refinement, you're able to prove 25% more assertions than you would otherwise at the slight expense of about a 50% increase in analysis time. So uh, sort of that, uh, so here's some experimental results from that work is sort of some high level things that I want you to gain from our technique is that, uh, you know, we're still very competitive when it comes to comparing against these state of the art other tools, so if you can read this, essentially Seahorn wins here with 187 assertions proved. We're in second place with 181 assertions proved, so we lost by six. But we have far fewer timeouts uh, than compared to these other tools, and that's sort of uh, what we think is a benefit of this algebraic analysis. There's a sort of consistent one algorithm that analyzes any particular program. I get a consistency and predictability in terms of my analysis, in terms of precision and time. Okay, so my overall conclusion for this talk is, uh, so I presented these ideas about algebraic program analysis. Uh, they build path uh, summaries up non-iteratively. Uh, they often give you this more consistent uh, analysis in terms of preci analysis, precision in time. So an example of an algebraic analysis is this framework of ICRA. Uh, so that summarizes paths using transition formulas. It summarizes loops using, uh, by extracting and solving recurrence relations. This allows it to generate nonlinear summaries, so we, uh, such as exponentials, logarithms, polynomials. Um, we, there's also this whole other work that I didn't talk about the I in ICRA, which means that actually these techniques expand to the interprocedural case too. I'm more than willing to talk about that if you want. And then sort of applications of ICRA include assertion checking, invariant generation, complexity analysis, these kinds of things. Uh, so just some, you know, basic ideas for future work, if maybe you've got any interesting ideas. Uh, we're interested in how these ideas explore or uh, sort of apply to sort of hyper safety verification, uh, sort of other data types. These are all numeric data types, things like arrays, strings, things like that, and maybe also sort of horn clause solving programs um, and things like that. So uh, with that, uh, I'm sort of more than willing to take some questions. So whenever I see, uh, you know, instead of doing an iterative style analysis, do something that's not iteration, um, my mind sort of jumps to things like elimination style data flow analysis, where you're sort of creating the system of equations and solving it that way instead of doing the iterative data flow. I is there a connection between yeah. what you're doing and, and that? Yeah, so you can think of, uh, 
yes, yeah, so you can think of, especially in the inter-procedural cases, setting up the sequence of equations. And then what actually gets happened in sort of the ICRA case is uh, it sort of creates these linear problems which just get discharged to sort of the standard thing where it, gets, it can be solved using these regular expression techniques. And then so it's this iterative solving the whole equations by using sort of the techniques here as sort of a subroutine. And so yeah, there's a, there's a real direct connection there. Uh, you talked about, oh right. <clears throat> you talked about um, summarizing uh, loop bodies where the recurrence relation isn't obvious mm -hmm. uh, by either finding a term mm -hmm. that you can express the recurrence relation for, or by finding some inequality recurrence. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what are the? Can you always guarantee? Are you always guaranteed to find to be in either one of those two situations? And if not, what are the conditions required to? get either one of those? Yeah, so it, it's not obvious. So I guess the uh, sort of the overall answer is there, if, if there is a recurrence satisfied, if uh, like an equation case, if there is a recurrence either for a program variable, it'll find those first. And if there's not, then it'll find a term. And if there's this, then it'll find it. The inequation case is uh, the theory is not as good. And uh, so it often finds in equations, but there's not the same quite guarantees. And it's, uh, it's actually, uh, it's not quite obvious about when that happens and when that doesn't happen. Uh, the main reason is there has to do this, poly or this polyhedral widening step in, in there. And uh, that can sort of be a little bit unpredictable. But I will say experimentally, yeah, we, you can almost always find information, especially like for most loops, like certain variables just don't increment or like may increment on some paths. And if like they stay the same in other paths, then you, know, you, you can extract that in kind of information. The examples for the uh, other data types you mentioned are very array-like. What about for things like pointer structures and those sorts of things? Are those, is that possible or is that? I'd be very interested, yeah. I mean, so we, I mean, we have some thoughts about some things that we can do there, but um, yeah, it, you know, so the, the, the idea would be generalizing to try and figure out some sort of recurrence-like theory that you could do for these sort of other data types. Um, you know, those haven't been explored very much in mathematics, so, uh, uh, so I, I don't have any particular ideas right now, but uh, yeah, we'd be very interested to sort of think about those kinds of things. Next talk is optimistic hyperanalysis for